start off we're doing part two of Nepal, which I didn't manage to get to finish last night. And yeah, so waiting. I wanted to kind of finish off now before I did anything. And yeah, today's countries will be once I've done part two of Nepal is Turkmenistan and Bhutan. So yeah, here we go. As to now we're on languages and legends and all. And yeah, as a Nepali language is also called Gurkha, Gorkali, Burkali, or Kashkara, and as a member of the Papari, Parari subgroup of the Indo Aryan group of Indo Iranian division of the Indo European languages, as Nepali is spoken by more than 17 million people, but mostly in Nepal, but also in neighbouring parts of India, and smaller speech communities exist in like Bhutan, Brunei, and Myanmar. And the patterns of phonological change suggest that Nepali is related to the languages of northwestern India, in particular to Sindhi, Landra, Landa, and Punjabi, and comparative reconstruction of vocabulary as supported this. Appraisal relating Nepali to Proto Dardic, Fari Sindhi, Landa, and Punjabi, as investigations of archaeology and history indicate that modern Nepali is a descendant of a language spoken by the ancient Khazar people, as the word Khazar appears in Sanskrit legal, historical, and literary texts such as uh, Manu Smriti from 100 AD. As Kalahana Raja Taranjini from around 1140 AD and the Puranas from 350 to 1500 AD and the Kashas ruled over vast territory comprising all of what is now Western Nepal, parts of Gawal and Kamaun now in India, and parts of southwestern Tibet. There's Ahsoka Chala from 1255 to 78 AD, called himself Kasha Raja Hiraja, uh, meaning emperors of the uh, Kashas, and in a copper plate inscription found in Bodhagar, Bodhagar and his descendants used Apa Old Nepali to inscribe numerous copper plates during the 14th century. After the Muslim conquest of the Rajputs of Chetagara, the Brahmans of Kanuj, Kanauj, and many others fled to the foothills for the Himalayas for, foot, for shelter and all. And the pressure of the migrants and the rising ambition of the local powers caused the Kasha kingdom to fissure into, small, into smaller principalities. And some Kasha moved into the eastern parts of what is now Nepal, where the language became a lingua franca of the region's ling linguistically diverse ethnic, group, diverse ethnic groups. And eventually, Prithiva, Prithvi, Narayan Shah from around 1723-ish to 75 unified the smaller principalities during and after the unification. The Nepalese were identified as Gurkhas or Gurkhalis, while their language was referred to a singular form of the names, and while the growth of a linguistic nationalism the name Nepali became increasingly popular among the Nepalese living in Nepal and in India. As a Nepali includes three regional dialects, like the Western, Central, and Eastern, and there is also a distinct dialect used by the members of the royal family and upper classes, as a dialect has a special lexicon and four level honorific system. And is in increasingly being adopted in by the educated middle class and new, the newly wealthy. 
as Nepali has a rich heritage of oral literature as well as a body of written literature that has been developed during the last two and a half centuries. And the vocabulary and written style of Nepali are influenced by Sanskrit and recorded with the Devanagari script. As a medium of law and administration, the register of a legal Nepali has been developed and enriched with Persian and Arabic words. As technical terms for the various administrative branches of the government have been devised and borrowed from scans, Sanskrit and English as needed. And while in spoken, Nepali has borrowed vocally from Hindi, Sanskrit, and English. So, yeah. That is language for you, but moving on to legends, as the Kathmandu Valley has been made up of three historic cities Kathmandu, Patan, also known as Ralitpur, and Bhaktapur. As Kathmandu is a city with a medieval filled temples, palaces, and modern high rise structures, it is a fusion of the old and the new. Another rich past in the history that speaks of gods and goddesses mingling with like mere mortals. One can find a story behind every temple, monument, locality or festival. As the valley of Kathmandu abounds tales of like legends, stories and that have been handed down from like generation to generation. And although an outsider may sometimes find them a little far fetched but the belief and faith of a people has kept the cultural heritage of the ancient valley alive and belief and faith of a people alive and breathing. So yeah, here we go with a couple of them. Let's surround the three medieval cities. Now, so the first one was when Kathmandu was a lake. And it's a bit like according to a popular legend, the valley of Kathmandu was once a lake. And there were lotuses floating around the big lake, and once the Badhisattva Majushri saw the bright flame coming out from the lo a lotus that seemed to be planted in a hill. He wanted to cl a closer have a closer look at it. So he, with a strike of his sword of wisdom, he crossed a gorge near Chobar Hill. And the water drained from the lake and out of his gorge and the valley of Kathmandu came into being. As Chobar was a famous gorge situated about nine kilometers southwest of Kathmandu. As the bright flames and the lotus turned into the Swayam Hunath Stupa, as a shrine is a holy to both Hindus and Buddhists. As it is one of the and is one of the UNESCO cultural heritage sites, and it lies three kilometers west of Kathmandu cities, and is situated on a hill, like around seventy-seven meters above the valley. And it is believed by the follower of Manjushri established a city near the Swayambhunath, known as. Manjukpatan, and according to another legend, that it was Lord Krishna who slashed through the guard with a powerful thunderbolt to drain the water that had submerged the valley of Kathmandu. And you see, yeah. Then there's the story of Kathmandap, a wooden building Kathmandu is named after. And once the celestial tree of uh, Kalpariksha came into human form to the city of to witness a festival and learn Tantric 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 saw through a disca saw through his disguise and bound him with a spell, which he was prepared to break if Kalpariksha provided we would from the celestial tree to a build, build a large building as Kalpariksha accepted and the wood was provided and a huge tree to wooden 
building was built from the wood and the wooden structure stands to this day as an image of Gorak nah, at the centre of the city of the ground floor named Kasvamandap. As the building is said to be constructed out of a single tree as the city of Kathmandu is named after the, that wooden building. As Kasvamandap stands at the crown of grounds of Kathmandu Dubar Square located at, located at the centre of the city. And then there's a house of a wooden goddess, Kamari Bahal. As legend has it that the goddess Telju used to visit the king in human form at night to advise him and to play dice. Dino. And one night the king Jaya Prakash Mala he looks at the goddess lustfully and enraged the goddess announced by that she will never come to him again. And she predicted that the, both the end of his reign and the fall of the dynasty were at hand. And when the king begged for forgiveness, the goddess at last made a concession. The king was to select a virgin child from a Nawari re castle, claim her the living goddess Kumai and worship her, for in this child she herself would manifest. And the Kumari is selected. From the Nawari castle, Sakya, a goldsmith who are Buddhists. She must have the 32 virtues, along with an unblemished body, the voice of a bird, and the neck of a duck. And she must never cry or show fear. To test her courage, the child is shut in a room where served heads of sacrificed animals are placed. And one that emerges without a trace of fear is one. Is the chosen one, and her horoscope must match the king of the, of the king in every detail. And she must also not also not bleed. And as soon as she bleeds during puberty or due to an injury of the goddess, is believed to leave her body, and the child is relieved of her duties as a living goddess, and search of another goddess begins. As a living goddess is housed in a building overlooking the. And Umantoka Palace and the Teleju Temple at the Kan Kathmandu Duba Square. As the entrance to the building is guarded by large stone lions, and one look if if one is lucky, you can get the Darshan and the Kamari as she looks out from the window on the second floor. Join the Kamari Jatra and coincides with the Indra Jata celebrations. As the king comes to receive Tika from the Kumari, as the king offers gold, a gold coin and touches the feet of Kumari while seeking her blessings. And yeah, that is essentially what I've got for you today. And yeah, I'll see you more later, so bye for now.